rápido. So, uh, good morning, everybody. How will did everybody get your tea or coffee or whatever? I got my tea over here. So we could talk and uh, relax and talk about some uh, tips in the surgeries. I was good morning, to everybody. Oh, sorry, but oh, yeah. did everybody get your tea or coffee or whatever? Okay, this is live on YouTube. Okay, we have a delay in YouTube for about, I think, 15, 10 seconds, uh, I thought. Interesting. Yes, sir. And, uh, okay, it's uh, right here. I usually uh, open uh, both browsers because uh, Zoom is usually in the Safari, but if I open Safari and I open uh, the WhatsApp inside the same browser as well, in the computer, so things get a little heavy, so uh, the internet doesn't flow well. So I usually open Safari, I mean, I usually open Google Chrome for uh, the uh, WhatsApp in case I need to communicate. It's better than uh, typing here in the uh, cell phone. Yes, sir. You can actually get uh, WhatsApp for web. Uh, you, you don't have to open it in the browser, sir. Yeah. Well, no, it's actually, easier to uh, the WhatsApp on your inside the uh, telephone. But uh, sometimes it's, it's good to see. It's better. Yeah, it yeah. makes our life easier, I think. So, uh, well, why did I choose the, uh, the subject of... Uh, internal limiting membrane peel uh, because actually we do internal limiting membrane peel in uh, some uh, special surgeries we can uh, tell macular holes epiretinal membranes uh, usually uh, mitral macular traction but uh, for uh, solely epiretinal membrane surgeries we do not always have to uh, do the view of the ILM, but uh, the experience prove, proved that uh, sometimes we have to deal with the ILM for epiretinal membrane issues. And also diabetic patients, uh, when we have the uh, very adherent uh, internal limiting membrane and also contributing for persistent macular edema or other uh, changes. So we've got to think of doing uh, epiretinal membrane PU uh, and uh, internal limiting uh, membrane PU all together in some Good cases. Good morning, sir. <clears throat> Is on surgery now? Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, so I will share with you my screen over here. And uh, I got this uh, video from the IT that I published some time ago. Actually, uh, last year it was published on uh, ILM uh, folding technique for for macular holes. So let me share the screen first. Can you see the screen? Just pause it for a while. So 
talking, can you see the screen? Large molecular hole ILM folding technique. It is there. So let me enlarge it a little bit. So this is a quite interesting video showing whether you should deal with the ILM or not to deal or not to do uh, anything for the ILM. But in the past, I remember back in 1996, 1997, when I started my father in 1997 in Canada, uh, uh, we did hole surgeries, but we did hole surgeries the usual way. I was in the OR in Canada with uh, Dr. Devaney uh, he used to do uh, the regular vitrectomy, and uh, we did as fellows as well. And uh, uh, we uh, we did not build the ILM as of yet. But then, with time, uh, we started building the uh, ILM for uh, macular holes, and uh, it was a, a different thing. We still were uh, doing uh, 20 gauge. So 20 gauge uh, is not, uh, was not uh, as efficient as 23, 25, and uh, 27 gauge as we do today. And so we, 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 we uh, were doing uh, 20 gauge and uh, surgeries lasted a little longer, but there was some concern uh, on uh, closing the macular hole. So the blood was centrifugated and injected the, uh, over the hole, and uh, that increased the likelihood of getting the hole closed. So that was the surgery we did. And interestingly, at that time, we used the wide angle systems, but not very often. We used the wide angle systems uh, once in a while. And I brought these uh, news from my previous retinal fellow that I did here in Brazil. And uh, I was telling Dr. Divini and the other guys there, oh, we should do more, uh, we should do more uh, uh, wide angle because we see the whole thing. We, it's better for us to do the, the tracking. But still the macular work, we applied the macular lens to see it closer. Okay, so let me start the video. <laughs> These are the pre-op OCTs and FA. The macular hole measures 844 microns as measured by OCT. It is a large stage four. The hyaloid is already detached. That's a regular vitrectomy, not inverted, with an air fluid exchange. We now use a wide angle lens. That's inverted vitrectomy. We are using a macular lens with a great visualization after brilliant blue, you actually have a very good view from the ILM. We open up a tear in the ILM, a vertical one. We start the peel in a rexis like movement, counterclockwise, lifting the internal limiting membrane and relieving all tractions around the macular hole. We complete the peel, leaving a great part of the ILM intact, as you see. It's interesting that you see that uh, how did I start the peel? And, uh, this is the detail. I grabbed a very uh, localized part of the ILM uh, superior, so far from the foveal area. So uh, that's the way <clears throat> you should avoid the foveal area. And then I created this tear. And from this tear, interestingly, I, I moved the ILM uh, to the opposite side. As you see here, it's very interesting where you get the ILM creating that there. The, the first thing is to create it there. It's not always easy to, to create it there, but you see here, you go uh, not, not deep into the retina, but you get the ILM, you go like a pinch movement. You do like a pinch movement at uh, uh, the macro area, but uh, just uh, below the arcade, 
as you see, you have the brilliant blue staining the island very well. So we have a, a pretty good view from the retina here. And so view from the ILM. See, you created the tear there. A small tear, just a tiny one, and then just uh, uh, spread it go towards uh, the inferior part. We open up a tear in the ILM, a vertical one. We start the peel. So it's easy to start rectus. a vertical peel. A vertical peel is not difficult to do. So you created that small tear. You see the vessel over here. You got to be very careful not to go deep and uh, uh, perforate deeper and uh, cause any bleeding. But when I got a small pinch over here and went downwards, I opened this uh, coma-like uh, tear. So what to do now? Should I keep going here and grab it here and uh, go around? No, you don't need that. So since, since you open the door, you just have to uh, get, you know, like a leaf flat here and uh, follow uh, the other way around. Take a look. Like movement, counterclockwise, lifting the internal limiting membrane and relieving all tractions around the macula hole. We so this is interesting because I grabbed the edge of the ILM that I just opened and I went towards the optic nerve. And so it was already open. So I just have to follow in case I miss this here and I don't have this part here anymore. What should I do? I should re-grab here again and uh, I will start from where I, I lost the internal limiting membrane. But this internal limiting membrane came out very easily. Very good way to, to peel the membrane. Take a look. Complete the peel, leaving a great part of the ILM intact, as you see. It's very important to get the most of the membrane. So you get the most, to get the bulk of the membrane and, and uh, keep on peeling. The thing is that uh, if you have this shape, take a look at this shape of the ILM, you have this uh, round and tubular shape of the, uh, the peel, you should leave it uh, uh, where you can see it. You should not just uh, uh, raise the flow or increase the uh, bottle uh, height, meaning that uh, increasing the intraocular pressure, and then it's gonna escape elsewhere. So how to keep these small pieces of ILM uh, there, so where you can see it, and uh, so that you're gonna use this for, for some purpose. Do you have an idea, Ashwara? Rodrigo, do you have an idea? What should we do with this? Uh, so what I have seen is generally that is used to plug the macula hole. Uh, to like ensure that there's better closure. Yes, yes. That's what I want to do. I want to plug the macula hole. But uh, this is uh, usually people get the shape of the ILM like a flattened shape. Could be easier, but maybe could be worse because uh, the ILM could fly around the uh, vitreous cavity and then you won't see it again. And uh, what to do? I will tell you what, what I did in this case. So I kept on uh, doing the ILM build. We now use the uh, closed tip of the ILM. Now take a look. So I completed the peel. It's uh, you know, round and uh, beautiful. And uh, I, if you see my tip, my ILM uh, forceps tip, it's round, very, very thin, round, but uh, it's not uh, sharp to cause any, any harm. And so I got the ILM, I avoided the ILM from floating around the uh, vitreous cavity. I was just uh, uh, holding it on the retina, but without pressing much. You gotta be sensible, you need sensitivity to get the membrane and not forcefully, forcefully put it over the retina and uh, create another tear, a deeper one. So you gotta be very careful this time and do things very slow. I just uh, get the uh, ILM uh, below the tip of 
this forceps, and I keep walking towards the uh, macula hole. But how to walk it without damaging the retina? You you gotta have uh, the uh, sensitivity in your hands attached, linked to the forceps and also to the ILM. You gotta feel it. It's not easy to feel the whole thing, but you gotta have your hands feeling the, the whole thing. Uh, even this small, very small, uh, different thing on the tip of your forceps might feel. You gotta feel it. Otherwise, you won't be able to do uh, to make this movement. To actually move the ILM into the hole. So I'm moving the ILM into the hole. You see the tubular fashion of the uh, ILM here. That's the way it was. Uh, you remained after I peeled it off, but it could be open. So you could do the same movement very carefully. So uh, because this was a large macula hole, a large one and uh, long standing decided to do this technique. So I put the ILM on the hole and with the tip, be very careful not to damage the RPE, uh, which is below. Uh, I just inserted the ILM. In a very slow and gentle fashion. Very slow and gentle fashion. See? We go downstream from nasal to temporal towards the hole. So you, see, you still have that piece over there, but I'm going to tell you uh, the hole is already filled, so you don't need to be yeah, you uh, to keep put, putting things inside the hole. It's a stuff in technique. So it's a way to deal with the ILM. So uh, I will do that one with Since the hole is a large one, the tip will fit in without a problem. You see now the membrane rolled over itself in a tubular fashion that makes it easy. So as you see here, the ILM is already there. And uh, so we don't need to keep doing anything else by this time, uh, unless uh, the uh, ILM escapes out. So you've got to be very gentle and avoid too much of a flow uh, in the uh, vitreous cavity. So uh, if your pressure is 40 or 30 or 35, it's okay. You should not raise it more. And uh, actually you should keep it around 30. If you have the uh, constellation systems, uh, the, uh, you, uh, you have the pressure control to 30, 35 is okay. And you have the Stellaris, for example, from uh, uh, Hochelon, you got to be uh, putting the uh, intraocular pressure a little low. Otherwise, the flow from uh, the infusion line is going to displace the uh, uh, internal limiting membrane. So uh, you, you should understand uh, how, how to do that enter. without damaging the RPE in very, oh. very slow, very slow fashion. We proceed now. Not yeah, as you see here, the hole, how big, how large is the hole? You see how large is the hole? And uh, we got these uh, ILMs in this tubular fashion. So using the... Uh, tip of the forceps, the round tip of the forceps, I put it inside. There are some other, uh, it depends on what you like to do and what is good for you and what does not damage the retina. Of course, this tip is, is perfect for that, but some have the, uh, even here in iTube, we have some videos showing the, uh, what they call the massaging tip or other different tips you got to be uh, using whatever you think it's uh, good and that the way it wouldn't damage your retina anyway. AFX, air fluid exchange, post-operative period. Now I'll do an AFX, and then you're going to see the post-operative period, uh, the whole uh, starting, closing. Number seven shows very clear media and a clear lens and a closing hole with the edges approaching. Thanks. So this is a very interesting way this is inverted vitrectomy, ILM folding technique for large macular holes. It is coming from elsewhere, I don't know where. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we finished. Let me just uh, stop it for a while. So if we are going to deal with the ILM uh, for uh, the purpose of doing the macular hole surgery, we got to know how to uh, peel it, of course, the best way to peel it 
uh, is uh, doing the, uh, a good uh, rhythm blue or ICG, so it makes it easier to get the uh, uh, ILM. If you just uh, see here another surgery involving the. Uh, so this is another one. This is one I just uh, showed you, the ILM folding technique. ILM folding technique is a very fancy one, but we have membranes involving diabetic patients. We have membranes very adherent. We have uh, double peel like I have here. This is a double peel where uh, we first uh, built the apparatus membrane and then when we took care of the uh, internal limiting membrane. So we have interstitial syndrome. This surgery here, uh, we got the uh, ILM with the cutter. This is very interesting. And uh, this is interesting to see some ILMs are very taut, meaning that uh, you don't grab them very easily. And this is very interesting because if you have a very taut apparatus membrane, how can you uh, remove it without uh, damaging uh, the retina? Here's another one was a double pill for uh, diabetic patients and some diabetic patients, they had laser, they have their intrinsic retinal changes. So uh, it might not be easy to get the uh, internal limiting membrane here. So you gotta be very careful. And in this case that I'm gonna show you, uh, it's still in uh, ITU and then we proceed to Oshima's video. We have here- Dot retinal membrane, ILM membrane. So how That's how a case do design do for taut epiretinal membranes. How to do with taut epiretinal membranes? You can notice membrane. by the FA and those CTs that the epiretinal membrane is very... Take a look here. You, uh, it, it's always interesting to have the uh, autofluorescent uh, because you see how deep is the membrane standing there. If you just take a look uh, from the indirect towards the retina, you might see the membrane, but if you don't have an OCT and uh, uh, the whole angel, you might not see how the membrane is deep there and uh, uh, causing a bad visual acuity. But this was not so bad visual acuity. This was at 2040 to 2050. So uh, I decided to operate on this patient because otherwise the membrane will be very deeply rooted and the outcome will be even worse. So current and deeply rooted here. on autofluorescent. The OCT from top to bottom discloses the irregularity of. So, as you see the here, the OCT shows how irregular is the membrane. You don't see uh, the uh, foveal shape very straight. And so, uh, you see here on the left, in the OCT image, you see here the retinal fold as well. Retinal membrane on the macular surface. Start now with the inverted 23 gauge vitrectomy using a wide angle contact lens. So we are ready the here. Core and peripheral vitrectomy and use brilliant blue. Uh, we already here did the air fluid exchange and uh, you got a very good view from the uh, macular area here. Everything is bluish and you see the internal limiting membrane there. So, how can I go over the uh, um, uh, internal limiting membrane without? With, uh, without uh, damaging retina. So still, you want to be very, very careful. We display color. As you see right here. On the right point to the appropriate view. Uh, my default picture change, I'd like to just a moment here, let me switch it back again for the other one. The moving preoperative OCT helps to see the macular adhesions. And this you see here, I'm grabbing the uh, internal limiting membrane again with the tip of the, uh, it's saying that my connection is a little unstable. That's my, you see, can you, can you see me? Can you, can you listen to me? Okay. it's. It's okay here and uh, in the uh, I will get the 
connection from the cell phone as well, just in case. Uh, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me, uh, Ashwara? It's okay. Is where the membrane is more here. It's better now. Yeah. We start the PO. You see, I'm getting the uh, kind of removing the membrane the same way. But right. it did not go just the way I wanted to go. So it's like uh, I did the internal limiting membrane PO, and uh, uh, it went around but without reaching the uh, actually the foveal area there so that's not a problem i just opened it's like you, you should treat it as like a tear I, I, caused, I, I, I did it there in the membrane and then i switched back the directions you see here i'm switching the directions back towards the uh, foveal area and since now i have uh, these edges lifted, we keep going, relieving the so I keep moving the around the, uh, the copia area. We extend the view furthermore to avoid any scaffolding formation towards the macular area. So it's easier now to unfold. Yeah. We perform some endo laser for peripheral retinal protection. Finally, it was easier to, to remove the membrane because I, I switched directions the other way around. So if I go back here, when I got firstly the membrane and I did the peel, as I said, it did not go to the uh, direction I wanted. So then I switched direction the other way around. As you see here. Uh, I change it from uh, clockwise to counterclockwise and uh, vice versa. And then I still grab the, the edges of the ILM. We keep going, relieving the attractions and completing the view 360 degrees. You, you always get the ILM back in case you miss it, where the edges are lifted. And so if you have a very good wide angle and uh, also macular view from the ILM, it's easy to get it and just uh, go either clock, clockwise or counterclockwise. Stand the view furthermore to avoid any scan. Uh, I'm standing the view towards the macular area. And going back and forth. Now I completed the view. We perform some endo laser for enlarging it. Uh, doing some of the endo laser, not very many people doing it. Yes, I like the endo laser just in case for retinal protection. Thanks, so yeah. And uh, uh, that was the case uh, from the uh, iTube. I have more there and uh, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, you might be able to, uh, to do that without uh, damaging the uh, the retina anyways. So, what did you guys think? And Vajendra uh, Sarkar is uh, just coming in. Good morning, Vajendra. Sorry to take a little long to put you in. But uh, welcome to our retina course over here. And uh, do you guys want to comment on the, uh, the surgeries? I want to say good morning to Erika Freitas. She's from Brazil, our very friend. As a, she's a retina specialist. And uh, Nicole uh, Rodrigo, you want to comment? Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Hudson. Hi, Jadeep. How are you doing? Good to see you again. Hello. Hello. I'm good. I'm good. I, I was there. I just joined a little bit late. I had some issue with the Zoom. But yeah. I could uh, see see from your first video. So, excellent videos. No problem. Thanks. I, I was telling I like you how to deal with the ILM from our right. surgeries. And uh, would you have any any tip 
that would uh, would uh, share with us and that would like to share with us in terms of uh, the ILMP? How you do it? Uh, yeah, well, uh, for macular holes, I think it's uh, pretty much as to describe that uh, I am doing more of inverted flap uh, technique rather than the free flap which you have uh, taken and inserted back into the hole. So in that, uh, I keep the ILM at the edge of the hole uh, attached uh, at least a uh, few clock hours so that I can invert that flap and put it back into the hole. So that uh, basically is useful because the flap will not keep uh, moving around in the fluid. Once you remove a flap and then you leave it from your forceps, then it tends to keep moving around in the fluid and it's very difficult to get it back. Okay, okay. So, so how do you do I just have the inverted flap. I uh, yeah, inverted flap is a good thing. And uh, what do you do for not letting the uh, uh, ILM escape in case, in case you miss it? What do you do? Yeah, so... What I what I have been lately doing is I just uh, put a small drop of viscoelastic over it. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, so, and, uh, that that just helps to keep it in place. And this uh, viscoelastic won't fall sideways. Uh, generally, it will not fall sideways. I mean, again, you have to be very careful with the fluid gas exchange, very like slow and from the nasal side, so that uh, you don't. Uh, you know, induce any currents over the area of the macular hole where the ILM is stuffed in. So generally it holds the ILM there. If you put a drop of viscoelastic over the hole, uh, over the ILM once you have stuffed it inside the hole. Yeah, very good ideas. And what I did, I have all the videos where I did, uh, I did the uh, ILM peel as the inverted fashion, as you said. But then I did not right. detach the ILM from from the the hole itself. I was just uh, uh, doing the round movement, the spiny movement, and uh, removing the ILM. But I then I inserted without detaching the uh, ILM from the hole uh, over sometimes or inside, like stuffing it, the hole. So in this case, I didn't miss the uh, uh, the ILM flap. So it's another way to do the inverted. Right. Uh, so that, that I think some people also use a temporal ILM. Uh, like after you complete the peel, you like take a flap of uh, ILM from the temporal area of the hole and then use that free flap, insert it into the hole. That is something which can be done. Yeah. Yeah. Very good idea. Anybody has any? I just wanted to I just wanted to ask you which forcep are you using because as you described that the, the tip seems to be really uh, rounded and non traumatic. So which forcep do you use? Well I will tell I for for many years I've been using the room max forceps. They have different tips. They have different right. and then recently I was using uh, the uh, catalyst forceps as well. Catalyst forceps is a very good one. And uh, they okay. uh, both have the uh, end grips. The end grips, I prefer them more. And uh, because they narrow down the tip at the end to, 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 to actually uh, grab the ILM. It's a very tiny painting over there and it's easier to get the uh, dialem. So the tip is not like that, you know, everything touching. So it's open here, and at the end they, uh, they, they grab. So there is a distance between the, the two shafts of the... Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that is similar to the uh, Alcon forcep or the Greisheber forcep. Yes, yes. So I, I like them both, you know. And uh, those days, my, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law is from uh, Fine Hub, Fine Hub, 
uh, he's from Pakistan, he lives here in Brazil. He has this uh, manufacturer and he, uh, he was doing the, uh, uh, making, actually making the new forceps. I told him, you should do this and that, that way. And uh, uh, it's gonna work better because we do the surgery and uh, we have this uh, uh, tip this way. And uh, he, he made some that I was using uh, two weeks and a week ago. They are very good, very good. And uh, the problem is that some tips are for single use. And some tips, you can use it uh, longer periods. The uh, uh -huh. fourth, uh, look at that, that I showed, uh, is, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not for single use. So I use it for now over one year or two years. I don't remember. So I keep it changing. The last one I, I used was uh, uh, from Catalyst. It's very good. So you gotta choose one that fits well for you and uh, if it works okay, you keep using that. Uh, of course, you gotta be very careful with uh, you know, grabbing the membranes and uh, since you know what I tell usually, uh, what I usually tell the fellows is that you gotta be very sensible, uh, I mean, sen uh, sensitive, getting the membrane over there and the feeling the membrane, even though it's very thin and uh, you've you got to feel it from the membrane towards the uh, forceps, towards uh, your handle and towards your hand. If you feel it, everything is going to be okay. If you just go see and do whatever you want to do without feeling it, because what, what do I say? What do I tell people about feeling and uh, being sensitive on grabbing the membrane? It's where when you grab the membrane, you know whether it's more or less attached. You know whether it's, uh, uh, it's the right place to, to grab it from, or if you just want to uh, uh, pinch it and uh, move it uh, away from the, uh, the rest of the retina. You understand what I mean? So you gotta, gotta feel the membrane. Yeah. So it's not easy task to do that, but uh, uh, with time, you get that experience. Yeah, definitely. I think for beginners, yeah, uh, you got to be very careful. And as you said that you need to have a very good hand-eye coordination and the feeling of a membrane is different from the retina. So you need to know that and Sometimes in the beginning, you might end up lifting the retina and then some kind of complication, bleeding, and at times can be disastrous. So you need to be very careful. You should know uh, when you when you have the ILM picked up and then only start the peeling. Otherwise, if you just lift and start moving your hand, you might create a tear. Yeah, you're right. So it, it takes some time, and but definitely your lens, I mean, the macular lens and the uh, lenses which you're using are very, very good for, to have very good depth and a very good resolution. So those are very important when it comes to ILM peeling. Another thing, JD, is that I like discussing these issues. You see, and uh, I, I learned this from Dr. Lamb. And I learned that in a simple issue, I was doing lasers. And uh, if you don't see, you have a ma hazy media, you don't do the laser. If you see, you go ahead and do it. And uh, that applies for everything, in, uh, including, and especially the uh, ILM, the apparatal membranes, and uh, all things you do in uh, vitro retinal surgery. So if you see the ILM, you go grab it. If you don't see it, you don't grab it. So what's the point of right. not staining the ILM? So I like staining. and. Uh, I remember Steve Charles, uh, years ago, he used to do ILMP without staining, and then he was uh, in one of our events, he was telling that he uh, was following some Brazilians that were staining the ILM, either with ICG or Brilliant Blue, I don't remember which uh, dye he was talking about, but then he, he saw how necessary and good idea is to stain the uh, dialem peel before uh, going towards it and grabbing it. 
So still that he does, he did, I don't know whether he does anymore uh, the island deal without uh, staying. I think he stands for uh, almost everything now, I think, for the ILM. Uh, so I, I got to confirm this info with him, but uh, uh, it's important that you see. So if you see it, and uh, some, yeah. Yeah. some countries cannot have the Britain and Blue, for example, Dr. Lam back in Hong Kong, he cannot have the... Uh, Britain and blue because of the uh, issues from the government there and uh, for health health issues there and uh, so they don't uh, uh, allow uh, Britain and blue but they allow uh, triple and blue triple and blue yeah They're using triple and blue yeah it's not that good but still it stains the uh, the LM it stains I I I use yeah that. I, I did some surgeries with uh, triple and blue but it does yeah it does stain. But not as good, and it it can stain the posterior capsule also. So then the view view might become a little bad. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. If it stains the posterior capsule, then uh, yeah, unless the patient is pseudophagic, so uh, but still mm -hmm. you don't get that much of a stain uh, as compared to uh, the uh, the other way. And uh, so you right. issue to discuss. And uh, since we have still uh, 10 minutes, I, I will display uh, the, uh, Dr. Oshima's uh, lecture. But if the sound yeah. go well, if the sound doesn't go well, because I have this, uh, uh, my computer here doesn't play very good uh, the sound, so I have this uh, Bluetooth, but it's out of battery. Yeah. So I've got a very good sound out of here. So. Now, because it's out of battery, uh, maybe won't display a very good sound as well. So if it uh, does not, you could continue next week, no problem. Because you know, these things are so interesting that we discuss with, uh, with time. And I wanna right. thank, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Anshuman Singh to participate. And uh, I think it's an honor for us to have you here, Dr. Anshuman Singh, I guess uh, it was. I you. think he's Dr. Anshuman uh, Sinha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, for it's an honor for us. Yeah. Anytime, if you want to uh, comment, this is a good thing for us that we discuss the cases, and uh, that's what, why uh, we are here uh, mostly. So let me. Try to share Dr. Oshima's uh, video over here. Let, let me see if the, uh, you tell me whether the sound plays okay, view, okay, or... Jaydeep, let me share the screen again. Sure. Okay. Can you see the, uh, the screen? Oh, this yeah, was, it is visible. Hi, Francine. So this was the retinosome meeting. So I'll go straight to the point. This was the retinosome meeting uh, number five. And uh, just that you remember, we have the retinosome meeting number seven. The uh, subject will be 007 uh, challenging retinal cases next uh, December. Yeah. Saturday. Right. And uh, we have uh, here the, uh, the speakers from Retinosome 5. And uh, we are starting now with Dr. Uh, Oshima. Now, I think the idea will be to find out the least way to treat an eye. And I think uh, this particular case is an example. I'm this is, all of us are agreeing to the. This is Natara uh, Can you hear well his uh, voice? He's doing an excellent uh, it is audible, but it's not clear. Okay, let me try turning this mic a little closer. In the last four retinosomes, we saw everything which we are uh, doing uh, through the past pen, and I think that's the reason I was thinking I should do something as a keynote speaker. I'm happy we brought out a point to the young people that old is not everything old is not bad, and everything old is also not great. And I think you should take up which is good for the.
situation. And I think that's what I think is a good last point by which England is great. That uh, as a, we, we as an experienced teacher want to tell the students, please pick up the right thing to do for the right patient. And whatever you hear, don't apply directly without knowing what it is. And I think you have some experience. And when in doubt, please ask. Just don't uh, do with doubt. Thank you very much for all the comments. We should go to the next case. Thank you, Dr. Natasha. Uh, Dr. Shima, do you want to share your screen to see your right. video, please? All right. So, uh, just one comment about uh, the last case and that you talked about. Of course, I also very agree with that, Dr. Chaka, but talk about you the laser mainly for the stabilized uh, aneurysm. But sometimes, you know, you encounter very big hemangioma. It's not easy to use your own laser only. So, in such case, I still prefer to prefer use the cryo. I combine with intravitreal injection of steroid because uh, stabilize uh, the inflammation most of that case. Otherwise, the big one, I don't think laser is a workout for such a case. All right, let me check, uh, give a talk about uh, uh, this uh, maybe the traditional uh, strategy for the option for the subject hemorrhage uh, treatment. I just show you the some option and I would like to discuss with uh, the panelist about which which would the best way you like to do for such a uh, severe case. Uh, so can I see my slides? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, uh, zero, uh, the natural cause for the subject hemorrhage uh, due to the AMD is very severe, so we need to use some uh, search for uh, the, uh, the farm top, uh, from court strategy to treat this case. So recently, most uh, doctors that recommended you the anti-VGF injection, but you know, just like this case, of course, this case is very, you know, the activate uh, CMV with uh, the wide surface hemorrhage. How would you like to treat this case? So some cases, doctors still talk about you the sim uh, simply use the anti-VGF. So anti-VGF can stop right the neovascularization activity, but you know, it's not easy to uh, disturb the sub hammers so immediately. So anyway, at the end of the day, you can see, of course, you can select the neovascularization, but when you out first, and you can see very wide layer of the post flow, the deteriorative RTP, RPE. So, so even though you can uh, stabilize the activity and uh, resolve the, the some hemorrhage, finally you can see the very big scotoma and the fixation point shift to the uh, near the arcade. So as a reason why you can, you can only get very low uh, visual uh, recovery. So the most more or less invasive surgical approach is to simply use the gas for the displacement of the sub hemorrhage. This is a typical case with the PD and the sub hemorrhage and the sub. Uh, the sub RP hemorrhage here. So, simply inject of the C3A with the expansive gas. You can use the light uh, pneumatic displacement. Uh, you can displace the solid hemorrhage. So, in this case, it works very nicely. So, you can displace uh, the sub hemorrhage to the inferior side and only leave the PED here. So, you can get a better visual recovery in the case. But, you know, not all, uh, every case can be rescued by such case, especially if it's, not, if it's not a fresh case. Fresh case, it's not uh, sometimes doesn't work. For so example, in this case, if you use ingest, uh, here I show you the, our standard technique for the uh, pneumatic uh, aspiration, uh, pneumatic aspiration for surface hemorrhage. I simply prefer you to uh, uh, once this is reached, the first aspirate to occupy the humor point three inject 100% C3 gas 0.5 millimeter into the intravitreal uh, cavity and make the face down position for five minutes then you can up, um, accumulate the aqueous uh, humor uh, if you the, uh, the volume to the uh, under chamber so we can re aspirate the aqueous humor 0.2 millimeter more so totally you can balance the, the total volume with aspiration and injected volume so in this case, you can see we can work very nicely and you can get a very uh, excellent visual recovery. Then I show here, not every case can rescue, rescue by this simple uh, injection. For example, in this case, we are a little bit old, uh, sub hemorrhage, even in inject gas, it doesn't work. Another case here, we can uh, encounter the uh, visual hemorrhage, a much more severe case, much more dense hemorrhage. 
And why did you like to reluctance may occur in such a case? So in such a case, we I still prefer you the surgical approach, uh, uh, correct and combined with uh, subregional injection TPA, and uh, sometimes also combined with the uh, uh, type BGF uh, drugs and uh, make the fluid exchange uh, of the volume of the fifty percent intravitreally, and you just like the accelerate uh, the new uh, accelerate the accelerate the displacement of the c uh, of the gas. So here there's a, a schema uh, scheme we have to use it. And this is the original text already uh, reported in several uh, uh, previous literature. And we use a very small gauge uh, needle to inject the fluid and expand the artificial detachment. And with combined with TPA or the or, uh, end with anti-BGF. And with a wait about 30 minutes, you can liquefy the sub region hemorrhage and uh, you can locking technique and shaking and make it much easier to uh, make sure the, the BSS with the uh, uh, sub clot. And finally, you just inject only 50% of the vitreous uh, cavity of volume to gas and series rate. You can make the face down position a couple of days can uh, displace the sub hemorrhage. So in the case with uh, hemorrhage only localized, Around the arcade area, uh, this sometimes the paper talk with this is the massive, but we don't see the massive. It's a moderate subway hemorrhage. We you prefer you the, the technique to uh, accelerate the displacement of subway hemorrhage. Here I show you the 27 gauge uh, surgical technique. Just a little bit old video. We use the uh, dog uh, camera. And this is the uh, uh, 29 gauge twin light shanja from the front right now. It's commercially available. And then you the wide on view system. You can see this is a little bit of old uh, separate hammer. So it's not easy. You only use the uh, gas only, can displace the separate hemorrhage. So I prefer you the subject injection. So initially I do the iron peeling. Um, and then I inject the subject BSS with TPA. And during the concentration, maybe around uh, uh, five, uh, 50 microgram to 100 microgram per injection. Otherwise, we encounter some subregional toxicity of TPA. So no more than 100 micrograms better. So in this case, you know, a little bit old one. So I uh, prefer to make create the artificial detachment widely and then wait for about 30 minutes and then use the locking technique to shaking to create the attachment much wider and make sure the BSS with the uh, sub the clot. And then try to use the gas, not fulfill the gas in the picture cavity, only about 50% or 6%. We can leave the other place to can displace the sub hammer to the infrared side. And simply move the old trochal cannula and come to, uh, to end your surgery. So, as you know, Dr. Tamar also deployed much more fancy techniques to separate you know, air bubble injection. But the one concern about it, my personal impression about it, is that uh, if you inject the bubble so quickly, you may separate the adhesion between the retina and the RP. So sometimes, of course, you can display the separate hemorrhage or separate clot to other places, but sometimes you may encounter the much higher damage to the photoreceptor. So it's, Personal opinion, I prefer you to still use the BSS gently, separate the retina uh, from the clot and separate it from the RP to avoid much uh, severe the damage to the photoreceptor. And show this case that uh, we can get very, more, uh, very good, uh, uh, favorable results. How about the much more challenging case? This is the, uh, the boros attachment uh, with the sub region, wider sub hemorrhage. Sometimes it's, uh, this case, in the Asian people, uh, we often encounter this situation because most of the people that aim this due to the PCV, once the picture lecture, they may encounter much more severe, just like this show here, the total attachment with sub hemorrhage. And in just a case, we already published the uh, previous paper, the video, about uh, how to treat the one. So most surgeons, uh, like the European surgeon, prefer to use the large or the wide retinectomy, retinotomy, to invert the retina and direct the aspirate the clot. But you know, the, most surgeons should show such a taking the very skillful surgeon, so he can do it very well and use the second oil to, uh, to terminate and stabilize that, uh, that uh, the subregional uh, 
seeing the activity and it has risen very well, but you know, wider uh, lysinectomy and conking PB are much easier, especially the case, it's a case, you know, the AMD case, sometimes that uh, RP is already very severely degenerated. It's not easy to attach to the retina. So for us, we, uh, we uh, innovated a very small, much, what's it called, less invasive technique because, you know, in such a case, it's not, we, we don't, I, we recommend not to make the, the retinal breaks uh, at the posterior side because, you know, such a case, the RP around the posterior side already uh, degenerated. So what's make the creator some, uh, in general hole to a split subretinal hemorrhage. After that, it's uh, easy to attach retina, uh, close the retina, uh, posterior breaks because you know that the RPs are degenerated. It's not easy to attach retina. If once you encounter, you know, you make the posterior hole, you may encounter PBR much easier. So most of the, even such a case, you know, peripheral RP is most healthy. So we prefer, uh, in such a case, we try to uh, perform the Intravitreal injection TPA one day, what uh, one or two days before the surgery, skip from surgery, and of course during the surgery we also prefer to inject the TPA just like the last case show. But in this case we inject much more widely to make a much wider uh, attach, uh, attachment because we have the experience we use the translocation. We don't care about how wide or how steep or detached we can create. And the point is to create a peripheral retinectomy at the upper side. You can do the uh, temporal upper side or uh, nasal upper side. You can make two or three breaks there because, you know, uh, we can try to, in the case, we try to use the tip uh, powerful carbon to displace the, the subretinal from the posterior to the periphery and uh, uh, makes the evacuation of subject hemorrhage from the peripheral uh, retinal breaks. And of course, in such a case, you cannot uh, remove the subject hemorrhage 100% during surgery. You must encounter, you should encounter the, some uh, subject hemorrhage still remain the, uh, underneath the retina. But don't care about it because in such a case, we finally, uh, we, we uh, I repeated this technique, injected that powerful carbon, aspirated the hemorrhage, and then uh, shaking, and then uh, injects more and aspirate. Finally, you can still re reduce uh, the uh, volume underneath the sub head, uh, underneath the retina, but you cannot remove all the, the sub hemorrhage, of course. So, finally, here we don't know, we don't like to use the, the, the silicone oil. We only simply use, and we use the prior to make the retina pexy and they inject the long-acting gas in it. And then why? We make the face-down position after surgery, and uh, then we can use the, the, just like the pneumatic technique to displace the subject hemorrhage from the peripheral region of, um, region of breaks we made. Because we use, the, we use the prior here, it's not laser. So even the subject hemorrhage passing through the region breaks, the long-acting uh, adhesion uh, by the prior can see final seal the retinal breaks in this technique. So in just a case, technique only used to make the small break, uh, small breaks at the peripheral area. That means much easier to attach the retina and count much less a case of the PVR. We already used this success technique for over 20 to 25 cases. We have never encountered any PVR in such case. The one drawbacks we need to remove the lens because we need to aspirate it. Uh, accelerate the subway ham, uh, re remove the crystal lens. If the student fake it, uh, eye is, is okay. Um, because even the student fake it, eye, they spread subway, uh, subway nuts, hammered into the anterior chamber. You can uh, aspirate from the anterior chamber uh, by the prosthetics a uh, couple of days after surgery. So here I showed how to, you, to treat the case. This is a case with a wide uh, detachment with subway hemorrhage. Uh, here is a 27 gauge. And you can see here, and the very, very dark clot. And in short, we perform the peripheral shaving, or could create a PVD, and then use the test to 27 gauge and 41 gauge uh, subject injection needle. And we use the uh, active injection to uh, inject the PPA with BSDS in the of space. And you can see the increasing the, the volume of the subway space here, it show here. And waiting about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, we can uh, 
liquefied the clot, just like show here, the color changed to the much uh, fresh red. And then we use the shaking technique to make much wider uh, area of detachment. And here make the clear, clear to break the bricks from the uh, peripheral area, and then gently inject the, TP, uh, the powerful carbon. You can see the very dense and the sunlight, uh, the high viscosity uh, sulfur hemorrhage can pass in through the peripheral area. So we have to take you need to repeat it several times, but finally you can get to remove the around maybe about 70 or 80 percent of sulfur hemorrhage. Only remain a little bit, still accurate as possible, but don't care about it. After at the end of surgery, make the pneumatic debasement can destroy the, uh, the residual sublate hemorrhages passing through the uh, peripheral breaks after the uh, face down position. And the damn surgery you can see easy to close out the wound. And here, show this case. Finally, get uh, this also show here. Uh, we can get uh, the complete the separate hammer to move out without encountering any severe complication. Of course, in such a case, it's the most RP already damaged. So the visual defect already maybe occurred and the visual recovery may be very severe, but it can prevent the blind even such a uh, severe case. So my personal uh, choice of the uh, surgical option for the sub hammer treating is if it's not massive hemorrhage, if the fresh case, we use the pneumatic displacement. If the dark cloth case, uh, we can use PVD combined with it, uh, pneumatic displacement. If a real old case, of course, it's very, it's very challenging. If it's a last eye, I still try to use surgical approach. But it's, uh, if it's fair light, it's, uh, it's visual acuity, it's work very well. Uh, I just simply use the VGF, uh, the VGF to stabilize uh, the neovascular activity. If it's a very bolus sublet hemorrhage uh, case, severe case, if the fresh one, I try to use the PV, uh, uh, pulse black, uh, not betray me with the TP injection sublationally. And if it's a dark rod or so, just like uh, this, ca this case, I showed you the surgical approach. And then with the old case, the old one, I just only do the observation because if it's a much more severe uh, solid clot, it's not easy to liquefied, it doesn't work in the, even, even with the subtechnomy. That way, can, another choice is to wider resnectomy to remove all the subregional uh, clot. But that we may increasing the uh, complete uh, high instance of completion about the PBR. All right, thank you for your attention. Uh, great, uh, you say again. I think, uh, uh, I think wonderful surgical techniques. And uh, the only comment is that the last case where you did a uh, uh, you injected a DPA, waited for uh, 30 minutes for a uh, blood to liquefy. Once I operated, Mark Humayun Zahan came from Pakistan and then it was about 25 years back. So, the bullets, uh, uh, subretinal, uh, at that time I was not uh, confident of doing the DPA and then the doing it. So, he told me, why not you do a vitrectomy? But if I get that time, 27 was not there. It was, I think, 2005. So, we did a 25 vitrectomy, inject DPA. And put a C3 FA and put her on head up position. All the subretinal hemorrhage uh, came down from the maxilla at least, and then the inferior hemorrhage went away. So I think the patient got uh, good vision and then later did a PDT. So maybe that one option is there for a massive sub subretinal hemorrhage for a surgeon who's not very confident. But a surgeon yeah. like me, we can do this TPA and clear the entire thing and have a good visual results. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, other other okay. techniques make can use external drainage of the sub hemorrhage, but you know, just don't talk about the drain, uh, sub uh, external drainage cannot remove the one percent of the. So interesting is a, a lecture, a very complete lecture from uh, Dr. Oshima on uh, using the, the uh, TPA for massive subretinal hemorrhage. This was really cool. You know whether. Yeah. Hemorrhage is uh, fresh, fresh, new, or old, and combined with uh, first plan of vitrectomy. Uh, you know, JDP, it was interesting to see how he removes from a small retinectomy or retinotomy the hemorrhage and keeps injecting the TPA and then waits for half an hour and to get the uh, hemorrhage liquefied. And so he can remove the uh, hemorrhage from the subretinal space and he keeps repeating that during the surgery. So the surgery could last hours, maybe two hours or more, and uh, to remove it and uh, 
we put it uh, TPA back and uh, remove it again. And, uh, and uh, uh, he, he mentioned that shaking technique. He was just shaking yeah. with the tip of the forceps on the, uh, I guess, the forceps or could be the, the, the curve without damaging the retina, just to, to move the retina back and, uh, backwards. And, uh, and here and, uh, yeah, I think the most difficult uh, aspect here is to create the artificial retinal detachment with the 41 gauge cannula, the needle, 41 gauge needle. It should be available. You should have one and then creating that uh, uh, artificial retinal detachment at the posterior pole, probably that is something which has a learning curve. Yeah, yeah, it is to, to create the, the artificial retinal detachment and then not be able to, to attach it. It's a bad issue, but <laughs> uh, as he said, yeah. many people do that uh, very good, very well with uh, silicone oil and clothing. And uh, the good thing is to peel the ILM. He was peeling the ILM as well for some cases. And uh, he was talking about uh, PVR. We should avoid doing too much of the uh, retinectomy unless it's necessary. As he said, uh, before uh, he did the retinectomy, he tried, attempted to do other things as well such as small retinotomy, drainage injections, and uh, combined with pastrana vitrectomy and uh, ILM uh, staining and the uh, peeling. And, and then you mm -hmm. avoid and should avoid uh, large retinectomies for removing the massive hemorrhage uh, because of the PVR issue. Right, right. Explained, very well explained. And, uh, uh, so, uh, but I, I didn't, uh, how do we do ILM peeling in such a case uh, where there is already subretinal hemorrhage? You peel first and then you do the remaining thing. But then, uh, does it stain? I mean, would you be able to see the ILM with the blood underneath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's what I would do uh, some drainage first. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to. to uh, to see the ILM maybe, I don't know. Because I don't usually do ILM PO for these cases. And uh, I, I, right. even though it's a massive, I go uh, in a moderate way. I, I prefer to do injection and then injection plus uh, gas to displace the hemorrhage. And then if nothing happens, if, uh, if it's taking such a long time to resolve, then I would go for a vitrectomy with a retinotomy and uh, go on with uh, all the repairs. But it's a good idea that uh, if you could do the ILMP beforehand, it's better. But uh, if you cannot see because the hemorrhage is down below, maybe it's better to remove it. But uh, good ideas. Probably it can be yeah, after removing the blood, uh, when he was injecting the uh, fluorocarbon, maybe just before that, do the staining with brilliant blue and then do the peeling under the ILM peeling under the PFCL. Yes. And also the fluorocarbon helps to displace the hemorrhage. But uh, if yeah, yeah. it keeps out, uh, towards the vitreous cavity, then you have to, you need an extra time to remove and clear up the vitreous from the vitreous cavity. But uh, still the uh, good thing I like to do the ILM peel with uh, using the perforocarbon is that I do vitrectomy and then I do after the exchange. After after the exchange, I use brilliant blue to stain the ILM very well. And then after seeing the ILM and, and then under, under uh, perforocarbon, then it could be easier to get the ILM because the perforated carbon is yeah. putting the retina, the retina down, so wouldn't move. Correct. Yeah, but, yeah I agree. These discussions today were very rich, and uh, I learned yeah. a lot from seeing this video from Dr. Shima again. And I just did a case uh, yesterday, uh, two weeks ago, actually a TPA injection, and then I did. Uh, uh, anti-angiogenic yesterday as well for the same patient and the hemorrhage that, uh, is quitting up and I'll give you feedback uh, in the following right. and uh, thank you very much for uh, all your participation and uh, I know thank the you. lectures help us discuss and also uh, these lectures are displayed 
in uh, YouTube for uh, the residents and fellows for further knowledge and learning. And uh, the good thing is to discuss. And uh, do you want to say anything, uh, uh, JD, for us closing the, the meeting? Uh, no, well, it was it was an excellent uh, uh, discussion today and very interesting cases and probably some things we can pick up from every time we discuss and implement in our practice. You know, it's very interesting to have these discussions because yeah. otherwise you are always following your things and you don't really, uh, you do attend or you see things, but then you, unless you discuss, you don't. Uh, tend to implement those things in your practice. Yeah, yeah. So good. this is really useful. Yeah, good thing is to discuss. That's why we participate in the congresses. Yes. We are more online than everything, and uh, we are I'm learning from your experience, Natarajan's experience, or Shimas, and everywhere. So yeah, the good thing is that the next time I'm going to try this and that and do the other way around and uh, you plan my surgery for massive uh, hemorrhage, subretinal, by doing vitrectomy injections. And uh, this is good for, uh, you know, discussions is good for the, us to decide whether to do this and that and uh, if we are going the right directions. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank definitely. you, Ashwara. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashwara. Have a good day, you too. And uh, have a and uh, hope to see you next week. Definitely, sir. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Bye. 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 Have a nice day. You too. You too, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.